Okay. In the in the interest of everybody's time, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and jump in and get started. And then again, if if folks join late, um, we'll get them involved in the conversation. Uh, first, thanks to everybody to join for joining. Uh, we're pretty excited about the new workshop format um, that we're continuing to kind of develop and refine. So um, certainly at the end of everything, uh, we'll we'll seek some feedback from you all on how we can continue to improve uh, your experience and and your takeaways from. Uh, from the time invested on your end. So thanks for joining us. Um, again, I think the goal of today, uh, we won't spend a ton of time together, but the goal of today is really to set the stage and provide um, some context and some framework for the presentation on Friday, uh, which will be by Marika Lawrence, who is the West um, Talent Identification Manager for U.S. Soccer. So she handles all of the territory from Colorado um, and then north and south all the way across to the west coast. So the country is divided into three and I'm sure she'll discuss that as well. But really want to provide some context and, and start thinking about how what she'll prevent, present to you on Friday relates to Rush and what you're doing in your own day-to-day -day environment. So trying to, to build that bridge for everyone. Um, so we'll jump right in here if I can figure out how to change mine. Here we go. Uh, so just just laying some ground rules for the for the workshop. If you're comfortable turning your camera on, I think we've got a smaller group and, and it, it will we'll do some breakout things and some other um, interactive uh, pieces during this session. And, and I think it's always good to be able to put names and faces and and continuing to build our networks. Um, the rest are pretty straightforward. I think just good Zoom protocols. Um, allowing space for others, really trying to interact in this portion of the workshop. Obviously, Friday's presentation will be a little bit more um, information presented from Marika and then you all consuming that information. I think this one, it's really to try to get everyone's talking and sharing ideas and, and getting some work on our end. Um, and then I think at the end, you know, we'll ask for some feedback. We're trying to refine this and and continuing to make the process better and more meaningful for you. So the more feedback we get, the better. Um, you know, I'm, I, I like to know where things are going and what to expect uh, on the front end of a, of a time investment. So for me, trying to think about what the agenda for our time together is today. So as it relates to the topic of player evaluation and how it, how it will connect to this last part of U.S. Soccer's um, kind of piece on Friday for, for me setting the context of where does player evaluation fit into the work that we do? Um, where does it start? What can we look for? And then, and then how can we really use those things to um, continue to accelerate the development of the players in our, in our rush network? Um, so we'll try to cover those things. And again, I think the more lively and the more interactive the discussion is, and we'll use some different methods to, um, to share ideas and feedback. And I will um, try to call on some folks uh, to, to share with the group, because I think that's much more interesting than a, than a one-sided conversation. So I think, um, you know, the, the first point is to step back and really consider how does player evaluation fit into the big picture of what it is that we do as coaches, administrators, uh, technical directors, and in, in whatever our roles are in youth soccer. So, and without context, I think things can be really difficult um, to plug into a pathway for players. So we'll, we'll kind of start here. So what is it that we do as coaches, clubs, technical directors? I think that's a good starting point. Um, so I'm gonna put you into some small groups. Uh, and again, I think this is an opportunity for you to share some of your ideas and, and I'll probably give you about five to seven minutes and I'll bounce between the groups just to listen. Um, so the, the piece here is if we think about successful player development, which we're all in the business of player development, regardless of whether we're administrators, coaches, technical directors, um, you know, based on the recent research in elite youth development, you know, player development can be boiled down into these four really key components. So I want you and your small group to brainstorm what those four key categories might be that make up this bigger picture of player development. And then when we come back together as a bigger group, I'll just uh, ask for some thoughts and, and what you all um, put down as, as maybe what these four components could be. 
So I will get you split into some breakout rooms. Um, and then if you can, again, join those rooms and, and have a discussion, then I'll invite everyone back in about five to seven minutes. So it should give you some time to share some ideas. Sounds like y'all are at least off mute. Lively conversation. So, what do you think? Before, what might be some of the components of player development? We had been we were waiting for Brian. He asked us to wait a second. So okay, that's why yeah. Fair enough. I don't think we're that shy. <laughs> All right. Um, am I on the right? Am I on the right track? I'm thinking about technical, tactical. Um, the other two, I'm thinking of. Side consult, uh, physical. That's that's what I wrote down. The technical development, the tactical development, their physical development, and then their psychosocial development. Those are the ones that I wrote down. That's what we've used in the past. I don't know if I'm on the right or wrong track, but that's what we're here for, right? So, so I would encourage you all to think um, like those are definitely the some of the core components of of player development, but thinking even bigger picture. Um, so those are all maybe the pieces that happen on the field, for example, but what are some of the other components that we could consider as part of player development? So I think there's that component of trying to identify or at least recognize that each kid's individual and they've all got individual needs and they're going to respond differently to different, um, pedagogical styles. Um, you know, so certainly instead of trying to create cookie cutters or use cookie cutters, I think we want to try to accentuate individuality and um, try to respond to that as well. On the right track. Definitely like, uh, so thinking about some of those other, other components. So what might be some others? And I'm going to jump out and jump in the other group. Um. Hi, Megan. <laughs> Hi. Um, Did you okay. all come up with some components for player development? Yeah, we were telling our uh, what we have in our own clubs. So what we're looking for the kids to learn. And we've got three, <laughs> I think. Uh, technique, tactics, psychologic, and we can have physical one. Physical. Yeah. Okay, last one, yeah. Okay, I think it's it's you're on the right track and it's a, a really good starting point. And the other group had this at a similar starting point. I think I would encourage you to those are all components that maybe impact a player on the field, which is a part of, of player development, but stepping back from maybe a club or a management um, perspective, like what might be some other things that a club or a coach would have to consider along that process of developing a player. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Yes, okay. Thank so, you. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, know no, that? You, you guys you guys should tell her. I think Megan speaks a little bit of Spanish actually. <laughs> <laughs> very, very little. <laughs> He's testing you, man. <laughs> I don't. I don't use my Spanish often enough, unfortunately. I would like to. Hopefully, in the future. <laughs> but that's important, guys. What do you think? Um, if you had to step back, right, 
and look a little bit more of the bigger. What happened? Somehow I ended up out of my room. That's okay. Everybody's everybody's going to get kicked out of their rooms in oh. the next 35 or 40 seconds. All right. You're so in the sorry, right. guys. I didn't mean to leave on you. It's all right. What will happen? We'll wait for the, the other group to join us. They're going to use their last 27 seconds here, it looks like. And then they'll be forced to rejoin. I think Brad, your point about the environment, I think is a really good one. We, you know, whether you're, you know, if you've got a top team, but they're, they're in an environment where, you know, there's either not enough space or they don't have the proper goals or they don't have, um, you know, the field quality is rough. It's going to be really difficult for them to, to be able to use the skills we're teaching them if the ball's bouncing all around in a, in a, you know, kind of a random way. Yeah. Something that's just, you know, Especially in Chicago, in the in the middle of late fall, the fields are terrible right now. Oh yeah, right. Okay, can you all still see my PowerPoint, or have I gone off the PowerPoint? Do you? Can't see it. Okay, let me see if I can get it back up. Better. Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, so I think some really good conversation, and I think just uh, observationally jumping into both groups. Um, the starting point was very similar in, in the idea of technical, tactical, um, psychological, and physical, which I think is, is what most of us were um, kind of raised on as players and, and many indoctrinated into the coaching ranks in the same kind of methodology. So, But asking the groups to step back a little and even listening just now to the conversation finishing about, but what about the environment? If you have a top team or top players, but maybe the environment's not what it should be, are you still really going to get player development? So, um, and again, this research is based on a 2004 um, paper that looked at elite, elite sports um, and elite youth development across several different sports. And so it boiled play de player development into four components. Um, and so those listed components, see if I can navigate my PowerPoint, um, are, are here. So the starting point being extensive knowledge. So for obviously as soccer coaches, we have to have a knowledge of what the requirements of the game are, um, what the rules of the game are, what, you know, how it's changed over time and those sorts of pieces. Um, that's always the first starting point to being able to develop players. And then I think the piece that we often think about because it's most forward facing for player development is the planning, the training and the competition. And that's what I think a lot of the conversation was that I listened in on about, um, you know, training players in a technical capacity and a tactical capacity, those sorts of things. And obviously, um, when we consider player development, we all know that your competition platform is really important and players being in an appropriate league and an appropriate level of, of challenge and, um, and resistance to continue their development. Uh, and the other two, I think, are two that we – do as checklist items often as coaches, but really can drive the process if we spend more time. And that's why we're dedicating October to um, player evaluation. The other two being accurate assessment of a player's capability, and then also being able to track and monitor how their development is, is going over time, being those four big buckets of player development. So again, we're talking about where does player evaluation fit in? And hopefully as you look at these four, um, it's relatively obvious that, that this would be the place where it fits in most cleanly. And then it also becomes an important piece of the progress tracking kind of bucket. Um, so again, taking a really big step back and saying, what are the components of developing players and where does player evaluation fit into the overall framework? Um, so for the next one, um, and, and I'll just ask you to, I could get a function kind of open on my computer. 
I'll just ask you all to, um, to, to, to briefly just type into the chat uh, what, your, what your thoughts are on this question. So now we know where it fits into the context for player, for player development. Where do we start when we're, when we're doing player evaluations? What's our starting point? So if you guys have some ideas or some thoughts, just go ahead and throw them in that chat box, and then we can all kind of look at those as they come in. I'll give you a, a 60 seconds or so to do that. So, so where else? We've got two answers there from Brad and Brian, which I really appreciate you all sharing. Where, what else? Okay, the game, perfect. Um, you know, I think we've all been, hopefully, at this point, a part of player evaluation processes. So um, what's, your, what's your starting point as a coach or a club or whatever that looks like? We'll give another 30 seconds to see if we can get a few more uh, responses or ideas about that. Okay, so we'll go, we'll go ahead and work off of those, those responses. So I think, um, again, players owning the evaluation themselves. Um, okay, great, another one coming in. So making sure they're on the same level, cognitive, age, physical skills. Um, again, observation was mentioned several times, the game, watching them play, watching them interact. So that being the starting point for our player evaluation. Um, I think these are all really good starting points. And, and I would challenge us again to sort of step back and consider uh, the, the bigger picture or the, the context within which we evaluate a given player. Um, so if I can, I keep forgetting how to. So I think thinking about where does player evaluation start? Um, it, to me, it's a little bit like a road trip uh, and, and the starting point for any really impactful player evaluation is, is the destination is really trying to think about what is the ideal or the desired end product. And then how is it that we're able to, as coaches who are maybe experts in this area, how do we measure against what that ideal end product is? And in this case, maybe that being Lindsay Horan, how do we measure a 14, 15 or 16 year old uh, player against what could be an end product of a Lindsay Horan? Um, if that's our ideal state at the end of a player's kind of maybe development pathway. Um, and again, it allows us to use those evaluations to assess where we are now as one of those four buckets of player development, and then also to track whether we're on the right route. Maybe we need to make a U-turn. Maybe we need to take a left turn instead of a right turn because we're not where we thought we would be on our pathway to that end product. So I think a really effective player evaluation in any circumstance starts with us having an idea of what it looks like down the line. Um, and the U.S. offers a particularly complex um, sort of acronym soup in some ways, um, because I think we're in an environment where we have to really start to consider all these things, as opposed to a coach working in Manchester United's youth pathway they have one very clear end point um, based on the manager, based on the club, based on the philosophy. I think Red Bull is a really good example in a youth um, environment here in the U.S. Whereas for a lot of folks, um, you know, you're contending with your club logo, the NWSL, the MLS, U.S. soccer, the NCAA. We're not always clear on where these players might end up. Um, so I think how do we decide what that end product is becomes the question for really, again, impactful and, and useful player evaluation. So we'll have a little discussion about that um, because I think we're in a particularly complex environment in the US. So again, in the, in the chat function, if you will, because I think it's interesting to just have kind of a record or, or for everyone to be able to kind of have an input and get to see what others think as well. Um, if we're thinking about determining a destination, 
what we know about the young players that we're working with now is that they're not playing in the current professional landscape. They will play in the game of the future, um, which is a particularly, again, challenging assignment. Because if we look at the way the game has evolved on the men's side and the women's side over the last 20 years, it's, it's incredible, the speed of, of evolution. So in the chat, if you guys will just kind of throw some ideas out there, what tools do we have currently available that can help us predict what sorts of players or what the needs of players will be to be successful when they get to that point in their pathway, whatever that is, whether it's a college environment or a professional one um, or a Rush U19 environment, for example. So what are some tools we have at our disposal to make those predictions? Okay, so a great one. And this is something that I think is, is more and more accessible you know, the last five years really of, of having access to video, access to clips of our own players, for example, um, and other youth players around the country and around the world. Other things that we might have access to to use as um, roadmaps or guides or tools to, to predict um, what players will need to be successful. or things that you're currently using in your club environment to guide, um, you know, how, how you determine what a player looks like at the end of their pathway. Nothing, no resources. Come on folks. This is, and it's interesting because I think as, as many times as I've had this discussion, um, especially in my role with U.S. soccer the last three years, I think this is often folks answer to this question. And, and um, the truth is we have a, a wealth of resources. Um, so another one just came in. So, so U.S. soccer is key qualities. I think that's a really good resource and tool as well. And Marika will take us through some of those on Friday. But outside of those things, um, we have access to more information in this moment than we've ever had in the history of the game. Um, if you've never taken the time or you're, you weren't aware of um, – FIFA's technical reports. After every youth tournament, whether it's a youth World Cup, UEFA does the same sort of thing. Um, there are technical reports that get released that look at what were the trends in the event and how do they compare to trends in the past. Um, they do this for the full Women's World Cup and Men's World Cup, as well as all of the youth events. Like I said, UEFA does this, and we now have access to, for a lot of folks, um, and you all mentioned it, right, game, game clips and video, Instat. Um, and the power of those instat reports, whether it's looking at current professional players or maybe looking at our youth players and comparing them to older age groups. We do that in Colorado, looking at our U14 players and comparing their statistics and numbers to our U19s. What are the gaps and, and where would we expect those players to grow over time? Um, and, and I just jotted down a couple of examples from the 2009 um, 2019 technical report for the women's game, um, there was a significant increase in positional fluidity. So players having to play between positions, switching roles and responsibilities in the flow of the game. So what does that mean for the future success of players, right? We have to think about those things. Um, the transition moments increased in speed quite a bit in the women's game this year, or sorry, in the last World Cup. 61% of regains happened in the first seven seconds after a turnover. That has technical implications, tactical implications. It's also got physical implications when we think about developing a 14-year-old to be successful at that level. Um, and then I think this is a common one that you see across levels. Uh, the increase in, in this idea of building out of the back. In the Women's World Cup across all games, only 9% of the passes were considered long passes. Um, and there was a significant increase in the percentage of time spent in a team's defensive third in possession. That has real implications for the center back that's going to be successful in the future or a goalkeeper who will be successful in the World Cup in six years, eight years, 10 years time. Um, and I think as, as youth coaches, we have a, a responsibility to stay on top of these things and understand how they influence the way we evaluate players in our current landscape. Um, 
so again, these are great tools and I think maybe I'm just a, a nerd, but um, things that I think are really useful and, and include all these reports also include video clips, um, you know, statistics, numbers, graphs, great tools to share with coaches and players as well. Um, so if you've not looked at those, I would encourage you to do so. So we're going to go back into some breakout um, sessions and, and, and I'll give you a little bit of time again, maybe around seven minutes or so in your groups to think about this question. Um, so if we think about the future game, because we're not developing youth players for the game currently, we're developing youth players for the future game. So what are those qualities or characteristics or skills that are going to be required for players to be successful? in the future sock in the in the future game um so i'll let you break out and kind of discuss some of those things and again i think um hopefully it'll be a robust discussion because i think there's so many things to to think about for players to be successful so i'll get the breakout rooms back up and running here um and give you guys some time to discuss and then we'll come back and share some ideas Lo que, lo, que pienso, lo que pienso ahí es que, digamos, antes, uh, ok, uh, 20 years ago, <laughs> um, if a player was good, like, skillful, it was enough, or, or if it was, he was, I don't know, maybe strong, really, like, had a lot of power, uh, again, it was enough to, to have a good performance, but actually like right now i think all of these components need need to be um on the same level like together it's not just one uh true take them and how, do you think, otro. And how do you think it's going to be in the future so we were saying for instance and you have a good point there you were saying now you have to make decisions but you also seem to make you have to make them faster than it was before. It's a, it seems like the, the, the decision making time frame that you have is getting shorter. Shorter. Do you think that's a trend that's going to continue in the future as well? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Then you have a good point. We'll wait on, on group two to rejoin us. Again, they'll get kicked out here in about 10 seconds, so they'll come back whether they like it or not. Okay, perfect. I think we have, I think we have uh, everybody back in the, in the group. Um, Again, can, can you all see my uh, PowerPoint presentation? Okay, yeah. perfect. Um, so I think some, some really interesting conversation bouncing back and forth between the group. Um, and, and again, I think, so, so calling out, hopefully you all don't mind sharing a little bit. Um, one thing I, I think, um, Brad, if you wouldn't mind talking about, uh, I heard you discussing this idea of accepting failure. Um, so can you talk about that and why you think that's something that a player might need to be successful? Um, yeah, it's just, um, I don't know. It's just something that I've come across over the years is just like you have really talented players that, you know, they were studs when they were younger and they were always on the best team. And then now all of a sudden they get older and, you know, players have 
short, you know, lessen that gap and they get in tough situations and, you know, something happens, doesn't go their way. They lose a final or something and they can't handle that failure. So, um, you know, like just accepting failure. I mean, if you look at the numbers for how many of them make it to professionals or, I mean, in the majority of our cases, how many of them make it to college athletes? Like those numbers are drastic drop-offs compared to youth enrollment and stuff. And so like players, especially the elite players, they have to learn how to accept that, hey, you're going to be told you can't, you're not starting today, or you're going to be told that you didn't make the cut. Like, and the best players are going to use that to get better as opposed to some that might just like, oh, I'm not good enough, you know, kind of that growth mindset versus fixed mindset type thing. So, Yeah, which is great. And I think it's probably not something that was discussed a lot 10 years ago um, when, when I was going through or 15 years ago going through the development pathway myself. Um, so I think it's interesting to think about what the future looks like for players and, and the demands that it might have mentally on those players. Um, from, from group two, um, is there uh, – something else that maybe come up came up in your conversation that um really thinking about the future of the game that you think is going to be key to a player's success if we've got somebody who wants to share from that other group yeah, so i'll speak as a, as a representative but paulita and and herman you, this this one goes for you so we were discussing about uh, the trends that we see and if we think that those are going to change or not. And one that the that the guys identified, that Paula and Herman identified was um, that the speed of the game is increasing in terms of the decision making. So basically you need to make decisions, you make to you need to make the right decision and it seems that like you need to make this decision faster and faster all the time. So that has an implication in the way that we train and the way that we prepare our players. But they have, so they have a couple of ideas about that. So Paula, Herman, you guys go ahead, don't be shy. Yeah, we were basically talking about that. Um, so regarding what, about what Brad said, um, the game nowadays requires, requires you to be mentally strong all the time. Um, as Pablo said, mentally really, really fast in terms of decision making. Uh, and also we were talking about that you have to be physically prepared for not only 90 minutes, but even more. So I think we will see bigger players, uh, you know, like Adama Traore, for example, in the future. It's, it's what I think. Yeah, thank, thank you for sharing but to, to all of you. And I think, again, there's data that backs these things up in thinking about 61% of regains happen within seven seconds of the turnover in the Women's World Cup. That has implications for a player's mental and physical reaction time um, and, and what their you know, reaction is to giving the ball away. Um, so I think, again, that there are resources out there that will help us understand what the patterns might be in the future and understand what the game could look like and it's not just randomly stabbing or guessing based on the way we like the game or, or things that we've watched in the past. So I think um, it's great that we have access to those resources and those tools in a way that we never have before. Um, so, so moving along just a little bit here, I think um, just 60 seconds on your own and, and maybe let's, let's pick as a key quality here. So we're all working from the same one um, decision-making for example, because I think that's something that you all spoke about. Um, players in the future of the game are gonna be asked to make more decisions and make them more quickly. So decision-making is an important component to their success. So thinking about the age group that you currently work with, or if you wanna do a couple different age groups here um, in the, in the small-sided or, or full-sided game, what would you actually see then? What, if we say the player is a, a strong decision maker, what would you expect to see from a behavior standpoint if you're watching a game that would tell you that that player is or is not doing well in that particular key quality? So I'll just give you 60 seconds just to jot down some ideas and then, and then ask, uh, 
come around looking for some ideas from you all. About 30 more seconds, and I would encourage you to also think about it as far as phases of the game. So what would you see when a player is attacking? What would you see when they're defending? Again, if, if they really are demonstrating this key quality of decision making. Okay, so I'll, I'll open the floor because I think it's interesting to, to, to get some, some feedback and, and hopefully you all um, worked in some different age categories or different kind of game formats. Um, so, it, uh, Brian, if you just want to start us off, what was, what was one of your behaviors or maybe which game format were you working from? And then what was maybe one or two of the behaviors that you listed? Um, I coach the youngest and the oldest out of these three, but I feel like personally – the most uh, obvious thing to a player that's good at making decisions is how often they scan the field. If they're constantly checking their shoulder when they check to a ball or, um, you know, just like, like the Xavi Hernandez is just constantly checking head in the swivel. Like they clearly are looking to make good decisions. And I think that's the most important part. Perfect. Um, Paola, do you have any, do, did you have one uh, maybe to add to that or, or a different um, behavior that you would see for decision making and which uh, game format were you thinking about? Um, actually, no, <laughs> no, no, I'm okay with it. Um, I don't know, I'll see. I think I'll prepare them from from little to just have fun and while they are going up uh, to the next level, they then they'll see that besides having fun, they just need to make it fun in like a team and make decisions with them and not only play alone. So perfect, and I think that's a at the end there a really good one that we see in in maybe getting into the 9v9 of, of players who are showing behaviors where they're playing with other players on the field, um, which maybe isn't something we would expect of a U6 or a 7 player as far as decision making, but maybe we'd start to see that at an older age group. So I think that's a really good one. Um, anybody have, a, have one that they're, that they're burning to add or, or something maybe different that they've got? And then I'll, I'll throw some examples that I thought of up on the screen. I think for me, for one of the, especially that sort of that transition age from 77 to 99, where you start to see players recognizing that in attack, it, it's really about appropriate spacing and attack where we're getting connected at appropriate distances and then we're getting compact as we lose the ball and we're defending. And so as they recognize that they're sort of outside their, themselves and stopping, the, they're no longer thinking about themselves alone as opposed to thinking about the, the group. Great. I, I love that. And, and I think to, to, to think about those transition moments as far as a, a demonstrating a player's decision making can be as they get older, having scouted for U.S. soccer, one of the places that we focus a lot of attention as they get into 14, 15, 16 years old. So I think it's interesting that you brought that up. Um, so just thinking about throwing some examples up here, uh, and interestingly, I chose a, a similar category because I thought it might come up, um, and I, I labeled it just tactical intelligence, um, and then listed some behaviors that, that you might expect to see from a player who's demonstrating tactical intelligence and how it might look different in a 7v7 player in comparison to an 11v11 11 11 player. Um, simply sharing the ball 
is, is demonstrating some tactical intelligence for a younger kid. Um, and as we get older, being able to coordinate your own movements with the movements of teammates, um, anticipating what might happen next. So anticipating moving into defensive positions or attacking positions like um, that was mentioned there at the end, I think a great one about looking at transition moments. So um, yeah, the idea here is just to really start to challenge and to think about, we all talk often, I think about tactical intelligence or the player is really technically clean or she's, or, you know, she's smart on the ball or smart off the ball, but drilling down to the level of behaviors that you would see on the field. How do we consistently evaluate that so that if we all went and watched the same game, our vocabulary and the lens that we're looking through is similar. Um, and, and some of the power that that has in the way that we then evaluate players within a club, within an organization, within a, um, a youth system, within a country, really. Uh, and, and again, Marika will touch on some of that. So just in the group chat, um, last little kind of interactive bit here, and then we'll probably five more minutes and we'll wrap up. Uh, so thinking about having clearly defined key qualities as a way to provide coaches, technical directors, scouts, a structure for examination. So once you have that structure built or you have it in place, in the chat, just thinking about what are some ways then a coach or a club could begin to use that structure? Where would they use it in their organization? Um, and hopefully based on the, the kind of overarching topic of the workshop, you've got one that's pretty obvious there. So how could we use this structure in a club environment? Just go ahead and type them in. I'll give you 60 seconds or so. Great. So, so forming a team, player selection, right? Tryouts. Favorite time of year. Perfect. That's a great one. Other ways we might use this structure. That's another, Brad's got another really good one here. So, so maybe determining the proper environment for a player, moving a player between teams or between rosters, maybe between genders in some cases. <laughs> yeah, Scott, Scott's pointing out the obvious one, right? So I think that, but it's important um, having this in place as a framework. So our player evaluations are consistent. If the seven of us are evaluating the same player, the outcome is similar. Any others you can think of, how we might use this as an organization? Rush, a club, a coach, a staff. Um, okay, so I'll throw, I'll throw a few ideas up here. Um, and I think uh, these are, are, are several that I think uh, come up a little bit in here. Uh, again, uh, evaluating perfect, evaluating um, players scouting talent identification right if we're going out and 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 uh another one just got added about the rush select program so scouting players for that program um selecting players for our rosters or moving them between rosters might be a way that we could use this structure um within an organization and, and then i've also added a few that that maybe are a little bit less obvious um but but to me equally important um so if we know the qualities that a player is going to be required to possess to be successful at the next level or successful in the future game, maybe that influences our club style of play. Maybe it influences the profile that we look for in a number nine or in a center back or especially in a goalkeeper. If you look at recent technical reports, um, the role of the goalkeeper is really changing. Um, training methodology and coaching philosophies. Uh, when when I, I know Pablo's group was speaking a lot about players are going to have to make decisions faster uh, and they're going to have to take in more information in the future than they are now. So if we know that, it might change the way we design our training sessions. It might change the way we give feedback to players during the course of a game or a session as coaches. 
Um, so some other maybe less obvious applications for having this really clear structure for examining an individual player and, and where they're at in their, in their maturation process. Um, okay. So last part, uh, uh, and I, for, uh, I, I have a background in education. Um, and again, a little bit of a, a nerdy bent. So, so what we know from education research is that forgetting things and then having to work really hard to recall them is one of the best ways that we can um, influence long-term retention of information. And I'd love for you guys to retain some of this at least till Friday. Um, so in an effort to increase your retention and your learning, um, just on your own, just jotting down the answers to these questions, uh, hopefully without looking at your notes, um, again, trying to just use your brain to, to uh, work hard to recall the information. And again, we know that immediate and timely feedback is also important to learning. So a chance to check your, check your answers. Next up. And then the information that we that we kind of discussed, hopefully that spurs a little bit of your um, your your memory. Get to go back and check from what we discussed um, as a group about the U.S. landscape and, and determining our destination. And last one here. Hopefully we got that one, it being the most recent. Um, and again, I think highlighting having a clearly defined um, structure for the way that you examine a player or, or their progress over time um, increases our consistency, certainly with those first four items and, and hopefully across all of those things um, among others, um, even down to the way that we maybe select our coaching staff for different age groups. Um, so uh, just, uh, just a little bit of a preview very briefly. Um, again, I thank everyone for your time and energy and participation and attention. I think um, it's a good first go for us and uh, in the workshop format. Friday we'll have, um, again, a presentation from uh, Marika Lawrence, who's one of three talent identification managers uh, with US Soccer. So that's a really unique opportunity to then get to take a look kind of behind the curtain for um, for how U.S. soccer has has developed and thinks about these sort of um, frameworks and what their approach to key qualities and player evaluation is in the youth national team system, um, and I'm excited because she's going to include some video content um, and some brand new things that they've been working on and really refining over the last four to six months while they've been um, removed from live scouting. They've done a lot of work with video and those sorts of things, so I think it'll be a great opportunity to really see what U.S. soccer is doing. And then we'll have an opportunity after to reflect on some similarities and differences in what's happening in your own club environments. And then what you might be able to take and apply to your own team club, um, you know, uh, uh, structure to, to continue to push and improve the player evaluation process. Cause we know that it is one of the four key components um, for player development over time and the consistency of it. So I will, I'll open the floor here. If anybody has um, questions or anything for the good of the group. Um, and, and again, I really appreciate your, your time and energy. And, and at the end of all this, we'll ask for some feedback. And I welcome that uh, for ways that we can really improve and push this forward for, for your own um, development and, and um, skill set as coaches. So questions from the group.
Awesome. I'll take the silence as a, as, as confirmation that we've covered everything that, that exists to cover. Um, and we've, we've clarified it all. So <laughs> appreciate that. And again, uh, look forward to having everybody online again on, on Friday. And that will be a little bit more of a, um, you know, a, a consumption based presentation where I think it'll be information presented and then us kind of consuming it and digesting it on our own. So a little different format, but really excited to have Marika, um, available. So, uh, thanks everyone and, and enjoy your afternoon and, and hopefully everybody's out on the pitch with players tonight. So enjoy. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Thank you.